um, getting right into the heart of our of our session today. Um, I don't know how many people to expect live. I know that a lot of folks are looking forward to the recording because it's in the middle of the day, in the middle of the workday for a lot of people. Um, but for those of us who already are here, especially if this is a new platform for you, I'd love to have you just type into the chat box and say hello, um, and maybe just share something that you are particularly hoping to receive from the session today. Um, we're gonna be moving through a lot of um, content, a lot of information, and hopefully some new ways of thinking as well about your digestive health and um, kind of core power and the relationship between our uh, physical digestion and our emotional and, um, and personal power um, and how that might be related. Um, so I wanna also really hear from you. If you're here, um, I see that there's someone here joining us by phone and I feel you and I'm um, happy that you're here. I'd really love our participants, um, Katie and Kimberly, who I see are um, already here in the main platform. Um, if you would just be so kind as to say hi in the chat and we can make sure that everything is working before we, um, before we dive in. Okay, and I feel like, um, and let me know please how, um, how the slide is appearing to you. Um, this isn't looking the way that I want it to look from my side, but maybe it looks good from yours. And I'm not sure how to do whatever it was that I did last night to make it look the way I that it looked last night. So let me know how that looks and if you can see that whole slide or not. <laughs> Katie says, hi, I'm excited to learn about herbs specifically for digestive health beyond ginger. Yeah, we love ginger. It's awesome. Um, and there's a lot more out there. Um, it's the sort of ginger is like the gateway herb, you know, to um, digestive, digestive healing. Um, and for many people, it's a great place to start and stop, but we've got a lot more, um, a lot more friends to introduce you to today. Okay. All right. And I see a couple more people are um, joining us by phone. Hello, hello. And Paula has joined us here in the room. Um, Kimberly says, hi, this is Kim. I'm so interested in this topic. I'm always interested in more natural approaches to ailments. And um, thank you, I'm glad the first slide looks good. Okay, great. So it is 101 and I'm going to just go for it because we have a lot to cover and I am I'm committed to completing our session um, in no more than an hour and 15 minutes. I, um, if, for those of you who are just meeting me, I am uh, really love this material. I love to teach and I love to um, be in conversation with you. So sometimes reining myself in and ending on time is, is challenging for me. So I'm really, I'm working on that. Um, so what we're gonna be up to today is digging into a really powerful connection between your physical digestion and how we can tune that up and get that to hum along, you know, beautifully and supportively for you, and the ways in which supporting our physical digestion um, also has a side benefit of helping to support us emotionally and, uh, and also in terms of our, our physical um, strength that is integrated through the center of our body, through you know, our core. And this is an, a pretty ambitious agenda that we have, so I'm gonna move quickly. And I wanna encourage you to please, if you have a question, if something isn't clear, um, type that into the chat by all means. But I wanna ask that, if, um, that you be patient, that if I, I ask to go over that question at the end, um, that you help to remind me when we get to the end so that we can keep moving through the content. Um, you will receive a recording of this session as well. So if something is not quite sinking in, that might just be a place to go back and listen to the recording so that you can fully absorb, um, you know, digest the teaching, the information. So, okay, so let's go ahead and get started. So I 
came to this topic in a very particular way. So I am a clinical herbalist, practicing herbalist, and um, that is my work. This is what I do for full time. And that means a lot of a lot of teaching, a lot of personal study and learning, and also one-on-one -on -one work directly with clients. And most of my clients uh, happen to have a, a mix of a physical issue, something physical that they want to heal, and then emotional and um, and spiritual stuff that's really tied in. You know, very the people that I work with tend to really experience themselves as as very whole beings. You know everything is connected. And I might say that's true for everyone, but I won't be that bold. I, I think that um, we have very different human experiences, but it is true for the people that I work with and that I resonate with. And it should be no surprise that the same kind of pattern is true for me as well. And in the last couple of months, I have had a complete revolution in my own um, understanding of my personal core strength, um, my physical core that can, you know, do planks and like, you know, um, starts to look like maybe it's having like an ab, you know, um, this is very new for me. And I realized that part of why, you know, even, you know, maybe 10 years ago, you know, six years ago when I was, um, a certified personal trainer and I was pretty strong and fit in a lot of ways, core strength was always a missing link for me physically. And I, at the same time, I had a lot of digestive problems. I had ulcerative colitis, um, which is a pretty serious uh, autoimmune digestive illness. And so I had a lot of kind of bloating and um, diarrhea, occasional constipation, but a lot of just achiness, bloating, swelling, all kinds of stuff in my in my abdominal region. And it made it such that um, actually engaging my core in any way was um, really challenging. And that was a piece of the strength that I could never really quite get. Um, meanwhile, I was also and um, having a lot of a, a lot of issues related to physical digestion, and at the same time, I was in you know a relationship in which I was really in kind of a, a subservient position, you know, with a wonderful person. We co-created it, not blaming anyone, but where I really was kind of um, over accommodating this other person. Um, where I was holding back some of my own opinions, where I was tiptoeing around um, a little bit. And all of these things were sort of connected to, um, connected to each other. So um, I only realized it recently when I started to actually get in touch with my physical core that it was only possible because I had already done the work of sort of supporting that really good digestion, clearing some of the gunk that had been present and making space um, for, to get in touch with these physical muscles. So we're not gonna talk about core strengthening today. Um, this program has been inspired by my dear friend and colleague, um, Katie Braha, who is here with us today and um, just taught a wonderful course about core strength. Um, and Katie, please, um, by all means, if there is a link or a way to get in touch for folks who are here who are not part of your course, um, please type that in the chat for us. Um, and so the idea is that, you know, we can do these exercises to strengthen the core, but if there's a bunch of stuff hanging around because the digestion isn't working, it's going to be much harder to actually engage this way. And then meanwhile, they're an emotional and a spiritual correlate to digestive stuff. So there are multiple roads in, and depending on where you are and what you're working on, you might identify with one or more of these pieces, but we're gonna weave all of them together throughout the course of this class. So just give me a little yes in the chat if this is sounding good and we're in the right space. Um, is this is this what we signed up for and we're feeling like we're on board? Um, just give me a little yes um, in the chat or a little like, no, what are you talking about? <laughs> if not. Um, so this 
slide here, this life without digestive fire. This is really describing the experience that I had quite a while ago and that um, I see a lot of my clients experiencing. So I think that many of us have, um, because of the kinds of stress that we're under, which has a very clear and uh, scientifically measured effect on our digestive systems, because of the, um, the chair sitting that we do for our jobs, because of the um, ways that many of us have been conditioned to feel about even the word power and having power personally, um, because of the food that we eat and the way that we eat it and how we feel about eating it or not eating it. Um, all of these things contribute to a, a dampened down power in that digestive potential, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And that is what leads to this kind of situation like I was describing before, you know, bloating or constipation, digestive problems, weird dysregulated appetite, food cravings or, you know, skipping meals, all of this kind of stuff boils down to not having a healthy and well-cultivated digestive fire in the center of our bodies. Good, I've gotten lots of yeses in the chat. Um, fantastic. So some of the basics about um, building good, healthy digestive fire right here um, in the center of our bellies are things that you might have heard if you've hung around natural health circles for a little while or you read, you know, any of the popular websites. So I'm going to give a quick overview of these basics because like all basics, they are really important, but I don't want to bore us by hanging out here for a really long time. So if any of this is new to you, um, we can talk about it more in the Q&A. So the first thing is, um, it really is very true that a lot of our digestive capacity um, and ability to assimilate and actually bring the nutrients into our bodies depends on a collaboration between us and lots of little microorganisms, you know, friendly bacteria living inside our digestive systems. So this is where good probiotics, um, fermented foods, so these are foods that have live cultures of you know, healthy bacteria in them, um, sauerkraut, kimchi, uh, lacto-fermented pickles, um, all of this kind of stuff. Um, and then fiber, because it is the, um, the parts of, of fiber and then also certain polysaccharides or long chain um, carbohydrates that are complex that actually feed these good bacteria. So it's been really fascinating, um, some studies done recently about the difference between the gut bacteria of people who eat a lot of fast food versus people who eat a lot of fruits and vegetables. And it's very, very clear that it doesn't take long of eating that sort of um, processed stuff to completely change the, the, the balance of gut bacteria. And this has now been connected to everything from mental health to digestion to your immune system. So that first piece right there, we could do a whole class on it. Um, but I think that it's sufficient to just say, like, this is a really important basic to take a look at. The next thing is to really think about this metaphor of digestive fire. So when you build a fire, you want to start with kindling. You start with little pieces, you know, or like my dad building a fire in the fireplace when I was a kid it was like he would start the fire on a newspaper, the easiest, quickest thing to burn. And then there would be little, you know, smaller sticks and pieces of wood and then the big pieces. You wouldn't start, you wouldn't take a single little match and then try to light a whole piece of wood. And you certainly wouldn't take a bunch of wet logs from, you know, from down by the creek and like throw them on the fireplace. What's gonna happen, you know, if you do that, that damp, wet log, it's gonna smoke like crazy and the fire is not gonna really start. So when I say treat food like kindling, it really means that we wanna eat in a way that kind of warms up the digestion, you know? So when, when you think about an appetizer, an appetizer is not like a huge, 
um, rattan dish full of crab dip, you know, like I'm at the beach right now and that's like what everyone seems to eat here. It's like all this crab dip. That's not an appetizer. That's a wet log. <laughs> it's not kindling. It's not a little bit to get things started. Um, miso soup. Many cultures around the world that are not American, like really get this right. A little bit of miso soup at the beginning of a meal. Um, it's warm. It's salty. It has probiotics. It's fermented. Um, and it has a little bit of you know, tofu, seaweed, a little bit of something to throw a little bit of kindling in there on the fire. Or you know, um, a, a wonderful starter soup. Um, you know, many European cultures um, have uh, you know, served soup as a first course of a meal. Um, so this kind of thing, think about starting small um, and then um, you know, being mindful that if you do eat something that's really big and kind of heavy, that then we're going to want to use some of the strategies later on that I'm going to talk about to help make sure your fire is nice and strong to be able to digest those. And we don't want to do it at every single meal. And then the last piece is not to forget the non-physical parts of um, building your digestive fire and your personal fire. So you want to be able to take a deep breath all the way into your belly and feel that move. Um, feel that move, the whole center of you. Um, it's really good to use your voice to sing, to chant, to um, to yell your friend's name joyfully, like across the you know across the street when you see them. Um, these kinds of things also touch right into that core, that center part of you, and um, and kind of stoke and warm up that fire. So, um, and then movement, you know, there are many specific yoga poses and um, yoga kriyas that you can do to help move and, and actually manipulate and, and massage these organs in the center of your belly. Um, and I highly, highly recommend learning about those. So one framework that we can use to understand this connection here between personal power emotional stuff and digestion and core strength is the framework from yoga um, and ayurveda which is um, one of the world's most precious and ancient um, healing traditions that remains intact today and the the yogis of old were able to identify seven centers in the body that um, they correlated with certain physical and psychological and spiritual functions. And many, many years later, we now see that these um, chakras, as they are called, or wheels, um, the word chakra means wheel, that, that this um, correlates very much with nerve plexuses in the body. So um, the solar plexus here in the center of your belly um, relates to all of the nerves that um, that go into your digestive system, to your digestive tract. And we now know there are more, um, there's more serotonin and you know, more neurotransmitters here in your gut than there even are in your brain. So this nerve plexus here at the center of your belly is very powerful and important. And what we're really working on today when we talk about all of these different things and connect them is the same thing that uh, yoga and Ayurveda are talking about when they speak about the third chakra. So if this is something that's interesting to you, I highly recommend the book um, Eastern Body, Western Mind uh, by Anodea Judith, um, if this is something that's interesting to you. She, um, she goes into this in very, very great depth um, and really integrates these two perspectives, Eastern and Western, in a way that's very accessible um, to people who are interested in psychology anyway. Okay, so now that we've laid out the landscape a little bit of what we're up to, um, I want to start talking about the herbs and about how to match your unique um, digestive, emotional, spiritual situation to the herbs that you're going to choose. And we're going to talk about um, some remedies for particular situations that you might be in. And we're also going to talk about kind of how to how to look at yourself so that you know which of them to reach for. So my caveat here, I should have said this at the top of the whole um, webinar, 
is that this is an educational tool that I'm offering today. And it's not going to be a replacement for certainly your physician or your, you know, your personal practitioners um, or, you know, for actual personalized advice from somebody who is working directly with you. So please um, take this and use it in any way that is supportive. And especially if you're facing a serious challenge, you know, something beyond what you would go to the, you know, to the drugstore and get an over-the-counter remedy for, something beyond that, um, make sure that you have a practitioner of some kind um, working with you and supporting you. It's very hard to see ourselves objectively enough to, um, to really find the perfect way to support ourselves when we're in a chronic or really, really, um, you know, challenging situation. So think of this as education and as a starting place. Um, and as a resource for uh, sort of everyday kinds of normal imbalances that happen to most of us. And if you try some of these things and it doesn't really help you, then definitely take it that step further and get some additional support or help. Okay. So let's start by taking a look at you. And once we've done that, then we're going to look more directly at the herbs so that we can make a good match between you and them. That's what makes herbal medicine work, is when we have a good match, we have the right dose, and we have the herb that's been well prepared. Those things are vital um, to making sure that these, that these remedies actually will work. OK, so I want you to try something right now. I want you to take the, um, the back of your hand and I want you to touch three spots on your abdomen. I want you to touch the top where your um, ribs kind of come together and where they meet. And then I want you to touch the belly button, touch right over your belly button, and then touch over your pubic bone. And what you're feeling for, you can use the front of your palm too if you want, um, what you're feeling for is temperature and temperature difference. So that top, middle, and lower position, do any of them feel cold? Do any of them feel hot? Do they all feel kind of the same? What do you notice there? And if you want, go ahead and type that in the chat. And this is one um, by itself. This is not uh, you know, diagnostic. It's not going to tell us if you're more hot or more cold. But it's one way that we can check in on this. And I want you to check this out now because if you start working with some of these remedies, potentially uh, we might create some change in this. Um, Kyoko says, colder belly button for me. Yeah, great. OK, so in herbal medicine, we, um, many of our traditions, we use what is called energetic language. So it's kind of like describing the weather. like. Instead of using words about like disease that sound very scientific, we look at a person and we see kind of like, well, what's the weather here? You know, is it a hot day? Is it dry? Um, or is it kind of like hot and wet, um, like muggy, swampy kind of weather? Or is it more like it's really cold and frozen? Um, or it's cold and dry? Or it's cold, wet snow? You know, uh, is it windy? Um, and these, these temperature qualities, they stand in as metaphors for the kinds of symptoms that a person will tend to have. And they help us really well to identify the right herbs that will help to support that particular person. So this, I think, that it tends to come pretty intuitively when we look at it on a very basic level. So if this is brand new to you and you are feeling like, whoa, uh, you're telling me, like is, it, like, is it hot and swampy? Like, I don't know. This is very weird. If I'm losing you, please go ahead and type in the chat and just tell me to slow down. Um, but I'm going to keep going unless I see any of that. So do not hesitate. Tell me if you're getting confused. Um, but we're going to go right in and we're going to look at hot and cold primarily today for the sake of keeping things simple and that sort of a basic enough level that we can really get it so that we can we can play with it. So when we have a hot digestive situation, the first thing to know is that does not necessarily mean 
you have like too much digestive fire. I won't go into all of the reasons why, but some of these hot issues can actually come about from low digestive fire, as paradoxical as that sounds. There is a possibility theoretically of having too much digestive fire, but it is it is so rare that I don't think I've ever seen any herbal books really talking about it or any, it, it's just, it's like a blessing when you have a great digestive fire. It's not usually something that causes a problem. Um, but this kind of heat, heat symptoms or heat related digestive issues um, tends to show up in the following way. So heartburn, this is usually a, a heat condition. Sometimes not, weirdly enough, but usually this is a heat condition. Acid reflux, same thing. Usually this is seen as something that is heat related. Um, ulcers also, which um, I did not list here, but that would be included. Excessive hunger. So this is different. Excessive hunger is different from emotional eating or kind of unstructured eating that causes you to snack a lot. Excessive hunger would be like you eat a full meal and an hour later you are fully hungry for another full meal, that kind of thing. Um, that, would be, that would be a heat-related condition. Sharp pain in your tummy. Um, so I'm sure everybody here at some point has had a gas pain, like really sharp pain that comes on all of a sudden and then kind of goes. Oftentimes, that is a heat-related symptom. Um, and then foul smells. So if you, are, if you are emitting gas from either end of your digestive tract and it really has a lot of, of odor to it, that's usually heat-related. Um, similarly, if you're passing stool that actually feels hot as, we, as you pass it, it's heat-related. So um, th this is the general picture of what it would be like if there's kind of hot symptoms. On the other side, if you're having more cold-related symptoms in your digestion, this is, bloating is a big, big, big one here. Um, there can be hot bloating, um, but then it would always be accompanied with like that foul smelling gas and pain and those kind of bigger symptoms. Cold bloating is more like you know, it just sort of feels full, but like nothing really hurts and it's just nothing's moving. And it's like, you know, or like your tummy just feels like kind of spongy and almost like, like, like it's a dish towel that's too wet and you need to wring it out. Um, that would be cold related. A dull appetite. So really feeling like food doesn't taste that good. Um, nothing is that appealing. Um, or I actually include in this category um, really not only being attracted to food that is very, very, very stimulating. So like the only things that sound good to you are, um, you know, really highly processed, like very, very intensely pleasure, pleasureful foods that don't have a lot of nutritional value, but have a lot of sort of um, pizzazz in terms of their flavor. Um, that would be a dull appetite. Usually that's cold related. Um, feeling like food is just sitting in your stomach, that's cold related. Weight gain and water retention often go along with cold digestion. Um, so this is usually like, um, for example, people who have low thyroids. Um, that is a very, you know, very, very classic sort of cold condition. Um, and then loose or messy stools. Um, this can go both ways, but if it's a hot situation where that's happening, um, the stool will feel hot as it's passing. With cold digestion, the stool could be loose or messy or greasy, and um, you're not gonna have any of those other sort of intense symptoms that you would associate with heat. So let's just check in and see how we're doing. Would you just type in the chat whether you think you're more on the hot side or more on the cold side, like when you tend to go out of balance. Usually we have a, a, a well-worn path. When we go out of balance, we usually go kind of the same way. Um, 
So all things being equal, which way do you tend to go? More hot or more cold? Or if you're totally feeling clueless and say like, I have no idea, <laughs> none of the above. David says hot-ish, yep. Paula says more hot, uh-huh. Katie says cold, yep, good. Emily says cold, mm -hmm. Kyoko's not sure. Kyoko, I can tell you, <laughs> I can tell you when we meet privately. <laughs> um, Kim says a bit of both if that's possible. Yes, it is, it absolutely is. Um, these can alternate, and some of us some of us go out of balance in many ways. So um, yes, it's definitely possible. And so then, for those of us who um, who have that situation, it's really important to um, to have some hot and some cold remedies on hand so that you'll be prepared for whichever way things are in that moment. So I'm going to give you one more little piece to help refine this understanding here. Um, Oh, and then, you know, emotionally and spiritually, this is, I think, going to be pretty easy. So think about, like, somebody, as they relate to their personal power and their emotional power, if they were going to go out of balance in a hot direction, what might that look like? We have words in English for this, too, that use, the, you know, that say hot in them. Anybody? I'm watching to see if any of you are going to start typing. You're emotionally hot. It relates to your power. What might it look like? Hothead, yes, yes, hot-headed, yep. So um, that's just one example. But yeah, like somebody who um, sort of pulls like power moves on other people uh, and, you know, yells at their employees because they don't feel powerful, but they're going to express that deficiency in a hot way, right? Um, we see a lot of this when you're driving in the car and people are getting furious, like road rage um, could be like a hot uh, emotional imbalance as they're trying to, they're feeling powerless to get through the traffic and they're getting real hot and pressing that horn. Um, and then on the cold side, um, this would look more like withdrawal or this would look more like suppressing your personal power, your desires, um, not giving voice to what it is that you need. Um, tiptoeing around others, ac overly accommodating um, would be more on the cold side. And sometimes the emotional pattern and the physical pattern are opposite. Um, I won't go into why because we'll be here for, you know, we'll be here for three hours. Um, but if that's something you're curious about, we can talk about it at another time. Just important to bring that, um, that holistic sense in. So one more way that you can look at what's happening with your digestion right now is by looking at your tongue. And if you're interested in this, when I send the recording, I'll send you a link. Um, I have, if you haven't already taken it, I have a free video course that's delivered by email um, on how to read your tongue. So we're only gonna do a little tiny bit here because you can go much deeper into this in the, in the video course if you would like. Um, but here are some signs to look for to be able to get a sense. So the first thing is to look at the sides of your tongue. So to read your tongue, you just want to make sure you haven't eaten or, dr or, or drunk anything um, for the last about 30 minutes. You're just going to stick your tongue out like this. Ooh, I've got some nice heat signs on my tongue right now. So um, you're going to look at a couple of different things. You want to start by looking at the sides of your tongue to see if there are any teeth marks. We have a great example here on the screen of some teeth marks um, on the sides of the tongue. If you have teeth marks on the sides of your tongue, that is usually related to more of a cold pattern. So that would be a sign usually that you need to warm the digestion up a little bit. The color of the tongue is going to help also to kind of tell the difference. So a more hot tongue is going to be more red or scarlet. Um, a healthy tongue is going to be pink. And then a more cold tongue is going to be pale, more on the pale side, possibly purple. But purple can also be heat. Um, purple really means a certain kind of stagnation, and that's a little beyond what we're going to go into. Um, 
And then the other thing you can look at is the tongue coating. And if the coating is really white, then that's usually a heat, or I'm sorry, that's usually a cold sign. If the coating is yellow, that's a heat sign. And if there is no coating at all, if the coating is absent, that is also a heat sign. It's a different kind of heat um, than that yellow coating. And again, you can go deeper into that in, um, in that tongue course. And the thing that's great about your tongue is it will change from one day to the next. Um, you'll be able to see it change in response to what you eat and herbs that you use and all this kind of stuff. So this is a really great way to sort of just check in with yourself and be and get honest about what's happening and how you're responding to the lifestyle choices that you're making. And it's also really helpful to differentiate if you're one of those like sometimes hot and sometimes cold people. This can be helpful so that you can check in on a daily, you know, more regular basis to see how you are feeling or how you're showing up that day. So when we are working with herbs to help balance our digestion or anything, in general, what we're doing is we're, we're seeking remedies that have the opposite temperature of our own um, symptoms. So if things are hot, then we want to balance it with cool or cold. And if things are cold, we want to warm them up. And this is what your body does naturally in that idea of sort of allostasis or homeostasis is the um, slightly more, um, you know, like what we were taught, most of us in, um, in high school biology, that the body tries to bring everything back to that middle level. Um, David's asking like pH balance. Yeah, in a way um, that it's that idea of like, the body has a range that it likes to be in, you know, like our blood has a certain pH that we like to be, you know, a certain somewhere between acid and alkaline where we like to be. And the body has systems in place to, um, if it starts to become a little too acidic, then it's going to pull some calcium and, uh, you know, balance that out and buffer it and bring the pH back down. Um, so, or up, I can't remember which way it goes, acid base, and base is low acid is high. I don't remember. Um, so um, David says, yes, thank you. Um, so yeah, so, so it is like that. So the body has a range and it will naturally try to bring us back into that middle ground. Um, and if that's not happening, then what we're doing with the herbs is we're providing some additional nutrients and phytochemicals um, that are going to help the body to do that and provide the resources to make that possible. So some cooling remedies for those of us who tend to get hot. The first one, um, dandelion, I love to teach about because all of us have seen some dandelions in real life and probably um, at some point we've pulled them out of our gardens, you know, angrily. Um, or maybe even spray them with weed killer. Um, you don't need to do that anymore. Now you get to use them as medicine. Um, the dandelion leaf um, is a great remedy, even if you just pluck it and chew it right out of the ground. Um, it is very, very bitter. And the bitter flavor has an effect on our digestive system that is really profound and fascinating. It causes us to secrete bile. And bile is um, the means by which we digest fat and um, help to break down some of the parts of our food that are hardest to break down. And so by eating that bitter flavor at the beginning of a meal, um, especially for a hot natured person, this helps to calm down an awful lot of those uh, heat related symptoms which often come about because there is undigested fat that makes its way into um, parts of the digestive tract where it shouldn't be. And then you get kind of the, the bad bacteria feeding off of it and hot, smelly gas and, you know, hot stools and all this kind of stuff. So dandelion 
um, leaf, even if you just have a single one before you eat a meal, um, there's big medicine in that. And it's just because you tasted that bitter flavor. Now, the leaf can also be used as a tea. And in that form, it helps to release excess water from the body. Um, and it does this while sparing potassium, which is important for people who have um, blood pressure issues. So um, dandelion leaf can also be used for sort of that um, like bloating kind of a feeling that's going along with somebody who is hot. Now the root works a little differently. The root is also bitter, but it, its action is a little bit more on the liver. And I like the root for people who are having that hot-headed kind of stuff going on, um, the emotional side of it, um, as well as maybe some digestive, some digestive stuff. Um, dandelion root tea, I think we should just, I think it should just maybe be in the water. <laughs> it's like really, really good for a lot of the stress um, and that kind of, uh, those sort of power games that we get into. Um, and dandelion, I mean, if you've ever tried to pull it out of the ground, it's a powerful little plant. It is standing in its authentic power. And then it is just, that flower is shining like, you know, like that beautiful yellow sun of the third chakra. So um, I just realized that right now. But um, this is kind of awesome in how it works. And then um, if you use the dandelion flower itself, um, you can make an, a really lovely infused oil, massage oil with it. And it has a beautiful aroma. And I think that makes a great belly rub. So when the dandelions come up in, you know, next spring, I want you out there harvesting them. And I want you making dandelion oil and rubbing that on your tummies, like till the cows come home, because it is just so good. So Katie's asking, what about roasted dandelion tea? Yeah, that's fine. That usually is the root that they that they prepare that way, and it helps with the flavor. It makes it almost like deeper and more like coffee. Um, as far as I know, that doesn't um, interfere with any of the benefits. Yeah. So gentian leaf. Um, I'm just going to say here gentian. I'm including because it is the strongest bitter that we have. Um, so this is a really good one for people who are super, super hot, lots of inflammation, lots of digestive stuff. Um, I like this in uh, tincture form, so in alcohol. Um, just a couple of drops in some water, drink that um, before you start your, your meal, and that can be supremely helpful. In a pinch, if you don't have any of these remedies on hand, but you're at a restaurant or you know somewhere that has a full bar, um, any kind of bitters that they have for making cocktails will work. So if you need a little, you know, a couple dashes of Angostura bitters just in some water, um, take that before your meal. Um, that is herbal medicine. Uh, that bitter flavor is going to work, however it is that you get it. Okay, marshmallow root cold infusion. So marshmallow root is, marshmallow is a plant. Um, that's where marshmallows originally came from. And no, I don't know how to make them, but someone does. <laughs> it's not me. You Google it. Um, so marshmallow root has a really amazing um, anti-inflammatory um, ability. And it delivers it in a package that makes it extra good for the kinds of pain and problems that happen for people with reflux and um, with ulcers. Um, so th then that can be esophageal ulcers, gastric ulcers, um, any, any of that sort of upper GI kind of ulcerations. I don't know if it's helpful as much for um, lower GI ulcerations, like if you, know, you're, if you have active colitis or something. I'm not sure about that. Um, but what it does is it has almost like has something called mucilage, which um, you might notice it sounds a little bit like mucus. <laughs> I know this sounds gross, but it's not. Um, so this mucilage, these are special polysaccharides or long chains of carbohydrate that have um, immune boosting properties and um, that they also have, well, I should say immune modulating rather than boosting because herbs don't, herbs don't work quite like that. Um, and 
And it also has a lot of anti-inflammatory properties, but it delivers it in this sort of like, like liquid moisturizer kind of a form. So when you take the marshmallow root in, when you drink it, it physically coats the um, digestive tract and it, it moisturizes it. And then that benefit, the, the actual healing compounds, kind of stay right on those places that need to be soothed. And I have seen this work with clients with ulcers, and I mean, people are amazed um, at how helpful it is. Um, I believe it also has um, some antimicrobial activity against H. pylori. So um, that's really helpful if H. pylori is part of why the ulcers are happening. So to make a cold infusion is very simple. It's easier than making tea. You just get your cut marshmallow root and you place it in, um, in your mason jar and somewhere that you want to brew it, and you let it sit for 12 hours. And then the next day, you stir it around and strain it, and you're going to get at the end this kind of, you know, that moisturizing, like, kind of thick, uh, you know, juicy um, part of the infusion. And that is where the medicine is. So you want to make sure to really squeeze all of that out. Um, using cheesecloth here is pretty helpful. And, and then I would use um, an ounce of dried herb by weight um, to a quart mason jar. And that'll usually make about three servings. Um, so usually people find that having, having you know, half of that mason jar um, you know, to, to the whole mason jar per day, depending on how they feel, um, and doing that for a couple of weeks is usually enough to make significant progress on ulcers and that kind of heartburn kind of, this kind of thing. And then peppermint leaf, um, this is cooling and it's also dispersing. So it has a, a relieving, that we call them surface relieving herbs um, in Chinese medicine. It has a quality of sort of releasing tension. And so, of course, peppermint is famous for its ability to support good digestion and is used after meals um, in many cultures. And, you know, in after dinner mints are still around. Um, there's a little, a tiny remnant of this tradition. And I also really like peppermint leaf in big doses and um, will encourage people to make peppermint lattes. So using lots of peppermint tea bags and brewing a really strong peppermint tea um, that's maybe even too strong that you wouldn't want to drink by itself, and then mixing that with the plant-based milk of your choice, you know, almond milk, hemp milk, um, whatever, whatever kind. And if you really insist on using dairy milk, that would probably make an okay latte too, but it's not what I would recommend. Um, and so, yeah, peppermint latte is a great way to sort of wake yourself up in the afternoon and keep your digestion feeling really happy. Okay. Let's go on to the warming piece. Um, David, yes, I am not going to say those words. Um, <laughs> um, he's saying a great alternative to Prusak, maybe. Yeah, I'm not going to say those words, my own self, um, but someone might conclude that, and I might not disagree. Um, so warming remedies. So this is, um, this is for people who are having more of those cold kind of symptoms. And I actually believe that because part of the, the crisis of digestion that I think we're having as a whole has to do with a culture that does not support digestive fire, um, these are good for most people when you're not having any symptoms. So if there's nothing going wrong, enjoy anything you like. Have a peppermint latte, have peppermint teas, um, have dandelion tea as a maintenance, um, but also really enjoy these warming remedies. They're so delicious, and I think that we all need a little bit more warmth in our tummies. So um, ginger, of course, which we, Katie started out by saying, like, I'm here to learn about herbs that aren't ginger for digestion. So most people know about this. Um, ginger is very powerful um, in terms of being um, anti-inflammatory, um, antibacterial, anti-nausea. Um, it can also be used as an abortive remedy for migraines. Not a lot of people know this, but it has such a powerful effect on um, 
the way that blood that that our blood is flowing in our bodies. Um, that if you make about a shot glass worth of ginger juice, just pure ginger juice, um, it's going to be really hot and really strong. And you knock that that guy back. Um, when you feel the aura of a migraine coming on, it can actually um, it most of the time does avert the migraine. So this is a powerful powerful herb with a lot of different uses. Um, and ginger um, ginger tea, either dried or fresh is a great, great um, support for cold digestion. Um, if the cold digestion is more severe, dried ginger is going to be better. Dried ginger is hotter um, because it's more concentrated. And um, I consider it more of almost like a metabolic stimulant um, because it is so strong. So um, I like dried ginger when, um, when the metabolism feels a little slow. Um, and then lemon and honey are great. Um, oh, Casey, I'm so glad. I was thinking, why am I saying this migraine thing? But it was for you. Um, I'm so glad. Um, let me know how it goes. Um, it does need to be fresh juice, but you can freeze it. So what I have people do is like either juice their own or go to the you know, health food store and get someone to juice it and then freeze it in individual serving sizes, like maybe in an ice cube tray or something, and then put it in you know, freezer bag so it doesn't get icky in the freezer. And then that way you have it quickly and you don't have to actually juice it right at the moment when you're in your aura because it's, it's pretty, um, you need to take it during that certain window. Um, okay. So yeah, lemon and honey are great. They're very helpful here um, as well, but you don't have to include them. So um, all of the sort of pumpkin pie spices, um, there's a reason why they're in the pumpkin pie. And there's a reason why um, these warming spices taste so good with heavy desserts like sugar and fat combined and dough, you know. And it's because these spices are very helpful to the digestion. And those, you know, a big piece of pie, that's like a wet log throwing on your fire. So having these spices helps to support the digestion. And cinnamon in particular. Um, has a ton of research about its ability to particularly support um, a healthy metabolic response and healthy blood sugar response. So um, these are really great, and you can use them in teas, and you can add them to food. Um, if you are a coffee person, then um, put your, you know, put some cinnamon in your coffee. Um, get the benefits of, you know, of all of the antioxidants and and all of that. Um, sort of uh, blood sugar medicine that it has to offer and uh, flavor your coffee without anything weird. <laughs> and then, um, uh, thank you, David. He's saying excellent analogy of the fire. Yeah, it's, it helps to visualize it, right? It's, it makes it a lot more um, clear cut when we can imagine what, what it's like. And then this last remedy I love, and I think many of us should be having it just daily. Um, this is golden milk. And now I think a lot of people are really waking up to turmeric and the incredible benefits that turmeric has. Turmeric is slightly bitter, so it has some of that di digestion sort of waking up um, power that some of those bitter herbs we talked about last slide have to, have to share with us. Um, and it is also one of the most potent anti-inflammatory um, and uh, antioxidant and anti-cancer herbs that we have. So um, I wouldn't want to be without it, and I want you to have it too um, if it works for you. So the way to make golden milk is to take equal amounts of turmeric powder and water, and you're going to make a paste. So you're going to mix them together in a saucepan, and you're going to just stir constantly with the heat on medium until you get a thick paste. And to get the very best effects from turmeric, um, you want to add some black pepper. Um, traditionally, there is a specific pepper called long pepper that is used, a pipali pepper. Um, but you can, you, you don't need to necessarily use the long pepper. You can use regular black pepper as well. Um, and that, the combination of those two helps your body to assimilate the compounds in the turmeric the best. So not a lot, just a little bit of pepper. And then 
once you've made that turmeric paste, you can keep it in the refrigerator for a couple of weeks. And whenever you want to have some golden milk, which is hopefully, you know, once a day or before meals, um, you're going to take about a teaspoon of that turmeric paste and mix it with, again, you know, a cup, half a cup to a cup, depending on how strong you like it, of your favorite non-dairy milk of choice. Um, really, really, really great uh, warming remedy. Okay, David says, I'm going to reverse the ad crap. Yeah, <laughs> I think so. Um, so, some thoughts before we're going to indulge. Um, and I hope that you do indulge. Um, I think that we live in a time when um, the health culture, the health community, I mean, maybe they've all, it's always been this way, but um, there's a lot of fear out there about food right now, um, specifically about carbohydrates, um, specifically about anything that is really pleasurable. Um, and so, yes, I want, you know, I want 80% of your diet to be nutrient rich. 80% of the time, I want you to be feeding yourself kindling and warming up your digestive fire and like really taking care of yourself that way. And then 20% of the time, I want you to take care of yourself with pleasure from food that is really awesome and intense, um, if you like that. Um, and that's gonna be a little different for everybody. And that might shift over time um, if you keep shifting your diet gently toward uh, more whole and plant-based foods. Um, including more of those, um, but I, I don't want you to feel like, you know, life is too short and um, what a gift that we can experience this pleasure. So why would we, let's, let's not deny it to ourselves, let's do it smartly and in a, in a way that supports us as whole beings. So before you indulge, um, having some bitters will, again, it will wake up those digestive juices, get that bile flowing so that you're able to really assimilate the food and it doesn't sit in your stomach, just stuck there. And then um, for Danny, who I know um, is going to listen to the recording and who had a question about um, low stomach acid and using digestive enzymes in order to support um, her, her stomach acid, but that when she doesn't take them, um, if she eats, she has all of the same problems. Danny, some bitters would be a really good way um, to kind of help to increase um, that stomach acid production in a healthy way, um, and also to make sure that other things that aren't necessarily just the stomach acid itself um, are also working. So that would be my first suggestion for you: would be to look into some bitter, um, some bitter herbs um, and having just a little bit of bitters before your meal. Um, and then cinnamon, um, really like some cinnamon tea, um, you know, cinnamon capsules if, if it's easiest. Um, and that is really helpful if you're going to, if you're going to give yourself a sugar bomb, any of those pumpkin pie spices are going to help. And then lastly, focus on the pleasure. This gets into the emotional piece here too. and and really standing in your, your authentic power around, um, around food and your choices. That um, when we're in touch with the core of what we want and what we really desire, and we're letting ourselves have it regularly, um, binging becomes irrelevant. Um, you know, barring any major uh, medical or psychological issues, binging becomes irrelevant when we respect our desires and we um, believe in our ability to have them met. So just starting today, um, when you're eating something pleasurable, focus on that pleasure. Chew your food well um, and give yourself full permission to have what you're having. Um, you'll be amazed at how much better you'll digest your food when your brain isn't telling you that you shouldn't have it. If your brain is saying, I shouldn't be eating this, I shouldn't be eating this, um, and your body is eating it, um, it's like, you know, there's... There's some um, there's some friction going on, you know. Like I'm not a car person. Like a car analogy was trying to happen about like friction on the tires or something. But um, someone else have to pick that up for me. But let's you know let's you know, align um, align everything so that we can um, so that in the center of us we're not feeling like we're torn or like you know things are fighting um, things are fighting each other.
Okay, so I didn't talk a lot about stagnation, but I'm going to just mention this here. So, you know the feeling after you eat Thanksgiving dinner <laughs> and it's like you don't want to move and like your tummy is full and it's like, ugh, like I got to just like sit on the couch and, and watch football now or I'm going to sit on the couch when everyone's watching football and I hate it because I can't move and do anything else. <laughs> That is a quintessential feeling of stagnation, stuckness. And um, this is relieved by pungent and aromatic herbs. So the thing that's in everybody's house most likely to help with this um, would be the peel of citrus. So lemon or orange zest. Um, organic only, please. Um, do not use the zest or the peel from uh, conventionally raised um, lemons and oranges. Those lemons and oranges that are conventionally raised, if you're only using the juice or you're only eating the flesh, is probably okay. Um, but if you're going to use the peel, um, go for organic. And you can just put a little bit of this into some, um, you know, into some hot water and add a little tiny bit of honey. Tastes really good and it helps tremendously. Um, I also include, um, I also, I always include some amount of citrus zest in any smoothie that I make. Um, cold and raw foods, even though they're really healthful, can sometimes be like that wet log on your digestion because they're cold and they're raw. And your body has to work a little harder to digest those. So when I'm making a smoothie, I add some orange or lemon zest in there. It tastes awesome. Then I add some of the juice so I get the vitamin C and all that stuff. Um, it tastes so good. Um, and it helps my body um, not to have that wet log effect from something healthy that I definitely want to be able to digest well. Um, there is a traditional Chinese herb called pinelia or um, banja that is uh, the, the king of all stagnation relieving herbs. I'm not going to go deep into it. I'm just leaving it here if you want to look into it more. Um, and then pungent herbs like black pepper, wasabi, and horseradish, they have that dispersing quality to them. And they help very much with digestion. Um, wasabi is served with fatty, heavy food in Japanese cuisine um, because it helps to balance. Uh, it helps to balance that food, and it helps to support digestion and helps the body to avoid the stagnation. Um, yeah. Okay. Whew. All right, we're getting there. We're close, guys. We're close. So constipation, I'm differentiating this, differentiating this from stagnation because they can definitely go together. Um, but this is the number one digestive complaint in, um, in this country. And at any given time, something like, you know, 50 plus percent of the population is constipated. So I know, like, we need, you know, we need this information. So number one, we need to start with good hydration, lot, enough fiber, and um, kind of get that underway. Um, that is usually enough for most people to have regular bowel movements. When that doesn't work, the next thing that I suggest is a remedy that I just call flax water because that's what it is. Um, it's essentially a cold infusion, like we talked about with the um, with the marshmallow root, but of flax seeds. So you take your whole flax seeds. I would take about, um, you know, a heaping tablespoon and cover those whole flax seeds um, in a glass, just, you know, regular like pint-sized glass um, with water at its room temperature and let that sit overnight. And then in the morning, strain the flax seeds out from the, um, the water, keep the water. Uh, that's what you're going to drink. That's the remedy. And then you can use the flax seeds for something else. You can put them on your oatmeal or you can grind them up and do something with them or you can throw them away if you want to compost them. Um, and the, um, the water is what I want you to actually drink. That flax water has that same sort of moisturizing mucilage property as the marshmallow root. And what it's going to help to do once once you get constipated, the bowel is designed to draw water out of the waste product. So it's drawing water and nutrients out. So if you haven't gone to the bathroom in a couple of days, chances are it's now it's getting hard to move your bowels because that fecal matter is very dry. So what we want to do is get moisture into it. 
And because the flax has sort of bound up this moisture with these polysaccharides, it's going to make it all the way down to where you need it. It's not just going to be absorbed um, higher up. So that's, that's my number one constipation remedy. Um, I really want you to avoid herbal laxatives. Um, it's possible sometimes to use them responsibly, but I don't think they should be over the counter. I don't think any of these laxatives should be over the counter. Um, they're very irritating. Um, they're very harmful on your gut lining. Um, they are uncomfortable to use and they can be habit forming. And all of that is true of the herbs just as much as it's true of the pharmaceuticals. Um, so, I mean, I would rather you buy over the counter stool softener that's, you know, full of dyes and stuff like that than, than use an herbal laxative. I feel that strongly about it. So, um, again, there are times to use it, but when you're working with a practitioner, not when you're just, that's the thing you're buying from the health food store for yourself. So, hot liquids can be really helpful for constipation. So, use peppermint and fennel tea instead, something calming and um, you know, that's warm and that's going to help to stimulate uh, your bowels, but that's not going to um, actually be a laxative, a stimulant laxative. Now, if emotional letting go is the issue, because constipation um, can come from your nervous system being freaked out and panicked um, or from feeling um, grief that you're not able to express or um, lots of things that are just bound up inside you that you can't express or that you can't let go of, that you're afraid to let go of. If that's the issue, or if there's a lot of stress, then I want you to go to the nervous system herbs. So chamomile is great here because it's both a great nervous system herb for relaxation and sleep and all of that, and it's a fabulous digestive herb. Um, in fact, it's, it's bitter. It's, it's a bitter herb. If you take it in a big enough dose, you will really know that that's true. Um, so chamomile and lavender is good here. Um, also that, you know, abdominal massage um, with your dandelion uh, olive oil that you made <laughs> in the springtime is really good. So David's asking what my opinion of vitamin C in powder form is. Um, you know, Vitamin C or magnesium, if you take an overdose, it will cause you to, it will have a laxative effect. Um, I would rather use those things than a stimulant laxative. It's not, I wouldn't want you to rely on it um, or to use it regularly, but you know, if it's a rare emergency and that's what you do, then it's, it's not the end of the world. I, I, I will accept it. <laughs> but I'd rather you try the flax water first. So I want to talk a little bit about gut healing because there is a lot of consciousness now about leaky gut syndrome, right? And I know M is here and has a question particularly about um, leaky gut and psoriasis. And, and um, this is true for all autoimmune conditions. Um, how, how are we working with this, um, this sort of mix of like um, antibiotics, which I really want you to take them if you need them. Um, and when we take them, they can change the, the gut flora for a period of time. Um, how do we work with that? And how do we work with um, you know, food allergens or intolerances that are, that are happening um, or exposure to things that um, upset our stomachs, you know, food poisoning or um, taking anti-inflammatory medications that disrupt the gut lining. Um, how do we heal from, from this kind of thing? Um, without going deep, deep into the immunology of this, um, my bottom line is that first we just have to remove the offending influences. So we really, really have to clean up and get the allergens that are present out. Um, no, that does not mean everybody needs to stop eating gluten. It's really um, not as, it, it's more prevalent than the very strict, you know, only celiac disease people should not eat gluten. There's more than just those people. And it's a lot less than some of these, you know, gluten-hating people <laughs> will tell you. Um, so, you know, 
you have to find out what's true for you by testing it if you're not sure. Um, and if it is true that you can't eat it, you really can't eat it. You can't eat a little bit of it. You can't have it because it is acting on your immune system and it is potentially um, actually breaking off and making a hole in the little tiny fingers, the microvilli that line your intestines and are the means by which you extract value from your food. When we have leaky gut, those, um, those cells are destroyed and then particles that are larger than should be getting through into your bloodstream are getting through. And the first thing that they meet when they come through those microvilli um, is immune system tissue. And that's why when you eat these allergens or you're having this kind of leaky gut response, um, you can get real swelling in your abdomen. Um, you know, people will say, like, I eat a little piece of bread and I look like I'm five months pregnant, like the next morning, like my pants don't fit. Um, that's not weight gain. It's not water necessarily. What it is, is it's immune system swelling as your body is sending resources to like the scene of the crime where it's trying to protect you. So when we're dealing with this situation, removing the offending influence is the first thing. You can't heal until, you know, until you get the like thing that's causing the trauma out of the room and things are safe again. And once that has happened, I really like people to work with a gut healing tea that is um, based on this recipe. Um, equal parts are what I suggest here. If you do not like the taste of licorice, which I do not, it's an amazing herb, but I really can't stand licorice, the taste of it. Um, you can leave the licorice out. And if you have high blood pressure, um, just for safety, um, please leave the licorice out if you're working with this on your own. If you're working with a practitioner, you may be able to use it, um, but leave it out if you have high blood pressure and you're just on your own. Um, this tea is really, this is magic, magic, magic. Chamomile is going to provide that little bit of bitterness that um, is going to help to support the bile production and work with some of that higher digestive part. Um, it is certainly an anti-inflammatory and it is gonna go right to your nervous system and help to calm down the nervous system component that is related to um, any amount of immune system activation. The licorice is a really incredible herb with more powers than I can go into now. I'm mindful of our time. And what it really is doing in this formula is um, serving as a harmonizing herb to help these others to work together really well. Um, and it is also bringing some, um, some adrenal supporting uh, capacity with it, um, as well as an ability to help to moisturize and, um, and uh, soothe the whole entire digestive tract. Fennel and peppermint, these are two really great herbs. Um, they can be used individually for um, people who have IBS type gas and bloating. Um, very, very, very helpful for that. Um, and they both just um, help to relieve any amount of um, gas, um, heat related or cold related kind of stagnation. The fennel is a little bit more, a little bit more warm, neutral and the peppermint is a little bit more cooling. And then calendula is the, this is sort of the, the magic herb that I added to this base formula that I learned from another herbalist, um, Paul Bergner. Um, I added the calendula because um, it is a wound healing herb. So traditionally we think about these kinds of herbs, that we call them vulneraries, Think about them as being things that we put on the skin to help it to heal. Um, but really, your digestive tract is a lot more like your skin than you might think. And when you've had leaky gut situations going on, there is like a wound that's on in that gut lining. And so having a wound healing herb as part of this tea that you're drinking regularly 
is very powerful. Um, and calendula is also a lymphatic herb, so it helps with the lymphatic system, which is going to be really inflamed when um, you have a food allergy, like we talked about. Um, and then it is also very slightly immunomodulating. So it's going to help with that sort of overactivity in one part of the immune system and oftentimes an underactivity in other parts that goes along with, like, why is your body reacting to this you know, food in the first place. Um, so it's a really good one to add. And honestly, if you don't like any of the herbs in this blend, um, you could just substitute extra calendula for them. Um, so um, Kyoko says, would you just order the dried herb and mix for the tea? Is this fennel seeds or leaves? Yes, it is a great question. Thank you, Emily. Um, yes, I would have you order these. I like mountainroseherbs.com. I have no financial stake in recommending them. That's just who I order from for dried herbs. Sometimes their shipping can be a little slow. That's my one complaint. Um, so just be aware of that. Um, and if you live in a place where you have a health food store where like they go through the bulk foods or the bulk herbs quickly, then by all means, you know, get them locally. But a lot of times those bulk drawers, like those herbs sit in there for a long time and they're not really active anymore. So I like to have people order from Mountain Rose. And then once you see the herbs that you get, like if you're if you're co-op, if the herbs look like that, then yeah, go for it. Most people find like, oh whoa, like these are really green or like this smells really minty. And it's like, yeah, that's how it's supposed to be. Um so yeah, Mountain Rose herbs. Um you can order from there. And then um for tea, if you're gonna make a tea amount, I like I would like to have you do, you know, do, you know, do about a tablespoon per six ounces of water. Um, I believe in strong tea. I believe in big doses and I believe in strong tea. So um, that's where I would have you start. You can always moderate up or down depending on how your results are. And if you're having an acute, um, you know, you're healing from leaky gut in an acute way, like um, Emily's question, um, I would do this three times a day. Um, if you were really wanting to get serious, you could also do this in the infusion method that I talked about. Um, but this time you would use hot water. So you could mix this blend and have that, you know, in your bag or your, you know, your, your container. Um, keep your herbs in the dark and keep them so that light is not affecting them and keep them cool. Um, they don't need to be in the refrigerator, but, you know, not super, super hot environment. And um, then, you know, if you want to make an infusion style of this, take an ounce of the dried herbs, um, put that in the bottom of a quart-sized mason jar, pour hot water over. Um, and this one, because this is not a nourishing infusion, um, which we steep those longer, um, you, could, you could do this for a shorter steep time. So, you know, 30, 30 minutes to an hour would be enough and just keep the lid on. Um, make sure that you keep a lid on top because we don't want to lose the aromatic oils that are um, that are part of the healing here. Um, yes, you could alternate with nettle and you might even as you're, you might find that you get more benefit from this than from the nettle. So if you're having a hard time drinking all of that stuff, um, you could take a break from the nettle for a while. I imagine that you're probably pretty replete with minerals at this point. Um, and the immune, the immune benefits and the Kind of blood clearing benefits of the nettle are going to be minor compared to the compared to the calendula. So it's a little bit more oomph in in that guy. Um, that's what I would think about to start. Um, and then I would really like I would really look and test like pretty rigorously. M like make sure like if you're having a flare that's as serious as the flare it sounds like you're having, I would be concerned that there might be an allergen that's somewhere that we haven't discovered. It might be something that we haven't thought of yet. Um, and I would test it, um, keeping a log so that it can really get to a really confusing place in our heads if we don't know what we're allergic to. So if you eliminate something, keep notes about your symptoms and how that's going for you, and then introduce it back again and keep actual written notes about whether your symptoms come back because otherwise we start to get afraid of all food and like really it's hard to figure out what's causing the problem. 
Oh my goodness, I feel like I've been on a sprint. So we have three minutes <laughs> of time for questions. So please, um, if you would like to ask a question of any kind, do not hesitate and do not wait. Just type it into the chat and I will get to as many of you as I can. And it would be my pleasure to do so. Um, what's next? So I hope that you have enjoyed this presentation. Please, um, please keep uh, please type in your Q and A's. Um, I would really like to um, to keep this conversation going. So this this is a great test, this sort of little one-off donation-based webinar. I hope to do a lot more of these. This was so fun, and you guys responded so enthusiastically. We had like almost 20 signups in two days, so with very little promotion. So I was really blown away. Um, and I would love to keep this going. So I'm going to send you an email with the recording as well as some additional resources um, to that tongue course. Um, and also a possibility of if you would like, if you're wondering about working with me one on one or getting some additional support, um, I'll send a link where we can set up a time to talk about that. Um, but hopefully we can we can chat about what you need and what other topics you'd like to hear. Um, so just reply to that email if you have anything else to share um, when you get it. Okay. So, um, questions. Okay, Kim says, you mentioned dandelion and chamomile. Can you mention any other bitters? Yeah, so gentian is that main other one. Um, there are a lot of others. Um, uh, Suntari is one. Um, Oregon grape is one. Um, a lot of those um, berberine containing herbs, um, golden seal, but don't use golden seal, um, Oregon grape, um, bar bayberry. Um, there are lots. There are lots and lots of others. Um, and then there are others that are, you know, part of different tradition. Those are mostly Western herbs. Um, but you're going to find that within Ayurvedic tradition or within um, traditional Chinese medicine tradition, that you'll find. Um, You'll find, you'll find them uh, kind of different ones within each culture. Um, I hope that's a good place to start. I really think, you know, part of the reason that I chose the herbs that I did to talk about is that I feel like these are good ones for people to start with when you're in a DIY mode. Um, they work really well, but these herbs tend to have fewer um, side effects or risks. Um, if you're taking medication, you know, if you have other issues, by all means, like, don't just take that as free reign to not check into them a little bit more. Um, but I really think these are a good places to start. Um, yes, oh, you're welcome. David, thank you. David says, very good. I've sat through a lot of health and nutrition talks and some, zzz, yeah, a little boring. Well, I find this stuff fascinating, um, endlessly fascinating. And so I hope that I've been able to con like confer some of that enthusiasm to, um, to you as you've been here participating. So thank you so much, everyone. Um, please, um, as we're saying goodbye, tell me one thing that you are going to implement in your life, one thing you're going to actually do differently based on what we have learned today. Because it is great to learn, but if we don't shift our behavior based on what we learn, then this kind of is just the same as watching TV. So <laughs> let's have it be different than watching TV, and let's let this change and support our real lives a little bit. So tell me one thing that you're gonna do that's gonna be a little different or that you might try just to see how it works. And we will um, read some of these and we will say a very warm and happy um, farewell. Katie says, thank you. I'm ordering gut healing tea ingredients right now. Um, I love the tip for turmeric paste to make golden milk on the spot. Yeah, mm -hmm. great. My understanding is that's the traditional way. Um, it also happens to be convenient, which is great. Um, Emily says, golden milk and order herbs for gut healing teas. Yes. Um, David says, bring in more tea and eating with less distractions. Yes, awesome. Kim says, I'm going to try the bitters right away and also check my tongue. Thanks for so much great info. Oh, you're so welcome. It is truly, truly my pleasure. All right, everybody, um, thank you for being here. Thank you for your 
enthused response. And I hope that this will be um, the first of many of these um, of these kinds of uh, of these kinds of sessions. So um, take care. And Paula says, I want to try marshmallow for heartburn. Yes, I love that for you. I, I'm very excited that you're at a point where you are ready to um, to brew some marshmallow tea. It doesn't seem like it's going to be too crazy or too weird. I'm really glad. Um, perhaps I should have suggested it to you sooner, I'm wondering. All right, everyone. Um, I'm so happy to see those of you who I know and love and happy to meet some of you who I'm just getting to know, Casey, David, Kim, um, and I hope that we will get to know each other much better over the coming weeks and months. All right, everyone, have a beautiful day and I will send this, um, I will send this recording out to you tomorrow. Take care, bye.